Okay, uh, good afternoon. I'm Stephen Williams, uh, I said I'm from Capgemini UK, uh, sorry, Capgemini Engineering in the UK. Uh, I'm an engineer generally working on high integrity software. For the last year, I've been working as part of a small team on a project with SEL4. Uh, Mark Jenkinson is also here at the summit today. Uh, so if you have any questions afterwards, come and find either of us. Okay, so a bit of background on what we've been doing. Uh, so we've been working on a project funded by the NCSC in the UK. Uh, goal of our project, really just to lower the barrier of entry for new users to SEL4. So the main output of our project is an open source developer kit that provides users with everything they need to get up and running quickly with SEL4. So that's everything from a full shopping list of the hardware they'd need to buy to follow the, the, the kit that we've provided, um, full instructions on how to wire that kit up, everything they need to set up their host machine to, to be able to access. And in terms of building uh, SEL4 applications, we provide a Docker image with all of the build tools and dependencies ready to go. Uh, to make things really easy, we also provide pre-built binaries of things like uh, pre-built bootloader and ready-to-use SD card images. So everything you need to get up, uh, up and running extremely quickly. Uh, I said this will be open source, to be released soon. <laughs> Watch the space. Uh, quick word on the platform that our kit is based around. Uh, it is the Avnet Max board. Uh, we wanted the developer kit to be accessible to both the academic and commercial sectors, so we didn't want to price anyone out of the market. So this is a reasonably low-cost board, retails about 150 euros. Um, with a state of the pound right now, I won't probably quoting you a price in pounds. Uh, <laughs> um, it's built on a uh, fairly commonly used family of SOCs, and uh, yeah. It's in active production, still readily available. So hopefully our developer kit won't become obsolete as soon as we release it. Uh, okay. One other key thing about the platform, uh, it's we actively chose a platform that's not supported or wasn't supported by SEL4 at the time of the start of the project. Uh, no one on the project had used SEL4 as of a year ago. Uh, we wanted to face all of the difficulties new users were going to face. So we deliberately started from scratch and started with uh, an unsupported platform. Okay, but the main focus we'd like to talk about today is uh, around device drivers. Uh, as I think it's been mentioned several times, availability of device drivers is a real barrier to use of SEL4. Uh, when we first mentioned this project on one of the SEL4 developer hangouts about a year ago, I think the first question we were asked are, are you gonna provide new device drivers? Uh, the answer is yes, we've provided pretty extensive driver support to our chosen platform. Uh, but more interestingly, the route in which we've provided drivers opens up a way forward to provide extensive driver support to many other platforms relatively easily and quickly. So this is one of the core outputs of our project. It's uh, the U-Boot driver library. So what is, what is it? What have we built? Uh, it's a native SEL4 library that allows you to use the drivers from a new boot uh, in the vast majority of cases with no changes to the drive drivers at all. There are some minimal changes in some cases, but we'll get into that. Why new boot? Uh, well, it's an open source project. It's actively being developed, it's actively maintained, and it provides a huge library of available drivers and platforms that are supported. Uh, Linux would also meet that criteria, but uh, Ubit has a much, much lighter driver framework, which was easier for us to work with. Uh, so we evaluated the existing driver support for SEL4 when we started our project. What became pretty obvious is quite a few of those drivers have themselves been ported from Ubit. Uh, work has been actively performed to take those drivers out of Ubit and modify them so that they run outside of the driver model framework that's within Ubit. We thought, great, that looks like a good way to go. We started working down that route and realized that as soon as you come to a more complex devices like USB, things get a lot harder. Not only would you need to pull out the USB driver, you then also have to pull out the entire USB stack and there are supporting drivers for things like mass storage devices and keyboards. Trying to pull all of those out and have them operate together, far too difficult. 
So what we look to do is instead pull out entire subsystems from U-Boot and have those run within a library. The key one of those is the driver model. Uh, once you do that, you can then run the drives underneath them without modification. So the main goals for the library we produced are, are to allow it to be easily extendable to other platforms and other devices and uh, allow the drivers from U-Boot to, to function with no or in some cases minimal changes. Uh, that's an incredibly zoomed out <laughs> architecture of our library. Uh, What's interesting though is that at its core is a complete fork of the U-Boot project. Uh, we've worked it that way. So, you know, a year down the line, you can merge in upstream changes from U-Boot and pull in support for new platforms and new devices that don't exist right now. Uh, outside of that, obviously there's some bespoke code we've written, which is a wrapper around that, those U-Boot subsystems that we're using. Uh, it provides the public interface to the library and it handles all of the communication with SEL4. Okay, so let's just cover what does the library currently do? So we said it provides pretty extensive driver support for our chosen board. I won't bother reading all of that. You can read those. Uh, we want the driver to be, the library to be extendable. Uh, so as a proof of concept, we've provided some more minimal support for a second platform. Uh, we chose the Android C2 because firstly, it's sufficiently dissimilar from the first platform we've worked on and uh, we happen to have one lying around, so perfect. What else can the library do? Uh, so it has the entire USB 3 uh, USB stack from U-Boot. Uh, that also comes with support for USB mass storage devices and USB keyboards. What we haven't put in at the moment is the EHCI USB stack for USB 2 devices. There's no technical reason that hasn't been done. It would actually be very easy to do. It's, it just hasn't been required for the work we've done to this point. So the library can very easily extend it to do that. We've also pulled out the subsystems from U-Boot that handle disk support. So the library can natively read and write to any file system or partition type that U-Boot can handle. Uh, one thing U-Boot doesn't do, it doesn't have a TCP stack. Uh, but we have allowed the library to be used in conjunction with external TCP libraries. Our developer kit has a demonstration application where we have used the Pico TCP uh, stack. So, so we talked about what it can do. It's only fair we have a brief discussion of what it can't do or doesn't do very well. Uh, performance, probably not uh, going to set the world alight with performance. Uh, starters, the U-boot drivers uh, don't use interrupt handlers in general. Uh, they expect to be polled. So if you if you have a use case for extremely high bandwidth or low latency, this might not. Obviously, that's not an ideal position. Uh, there are also cases where to uh, within the wrapper we've put around the U-boot code to allow us to not make any changes to the drivers themselves. Uh, there are some potentially suboptimal things going on. So there might be repeated memory allocation, copying and deallocation, which would hurt performance. Uh, in certain cases, uh, individual drivers could be optimized to remove that if that was an absolute showstopper 21. Uh, there is no Wi-Fi support. Clearly, there's not much of a use case for Wi-Fi in a bootloader. So UPIT doesn't have any Wi-Fi support, so neither does our library. Uh, <laughs> and uh, formal verification is unlikely to be <laughs> On the agenda, obviously, this comes from U-Boot. Uh, the U-Boot code was never written with that sort of uh, constraint in mind. Uh, so we can't perform magic, I'm afraid. Obviously, if you want high performance, uh, verifiable drivers, then we've already had the talk on the, uh, on the driver framework. Uh, that's, that's probably where you'll need to be looking. The difference here is we can give you drivers very quickly and very easily. Uh, OK. A few uh, slides on some of the main technical challenges we face in putting this library together. Uh, the first one is actually getting the code to compile, <laughs> which has turned out to be a real problem. Um, U-Boot is an incredibly configurable tool to be able to support all of those different platforms and all the different constraints. What it really breaks down to is a lot of that complexity is encoded in the U-Boot build system. So when you 
dig down, what it's really doing is selecting the set of source files to compile for a particular platform and configuring a very wide range of preprocessor macros that UBoot uses to configure the code. Uh, we put this under CamCares, so we can't bring our own build system, unfortunately. Um, so UBoot uses kconfig, um, we're stuck with CMake. So there really is no alternative here whilst using CamCare. Cam, cam keys, I've been told it's how it's pronounced, cam keys, is to, uh, is to replace the UBoot build system. So we have produced a, the minimal recreation necessary uh, in CMake of the UBoot build system. It's fairly modular in the way it works. Uh, we've done a lot of the heavy lifting from the library side. When you're adding a new driver, all you need to do is list the source files associated with that driver and to find any of those preprocessor macros that are associated with the driver. Usually there are none. Uh, and then if you're adding a new platform, you just need to list the associated drivers for that platform. So once we put the infrastructure in place, extending for this is, is actually not too hard. Uh, and in a lot of cases, the logic in the CMake script we provide uh, automatically converts from the existing SEL4 build options into the U-Boot equivalent preprocessor macros. So things like setting up platform and architecture is all handled for you. Uh, next main problem in building this library is initialization. Uh, so obviously the initialization that U-Boot performs is a lot about basic hardware setup and configuration. That's very different to what we need to do as part of a library. Uh, so we've had to build a bespoke initialization flow for the library. Uh, so one of the first things it does is uh, very SEL4 specific. We have to map the memory IO addresses of any hardware we wish to access into the virtual address release of our, of our application. Uh, the UBoot driver model, which is the framework, uh, makes very extensive uses of, uh, of the device tree. Uh, it loads lots of the settings for the drivers, it accesses uh, addresses from there, for example. Uh, so the library needs to create a tailored version of the device tree uh, to, pass to, to, pass to, to pass to the UBoot subsystems that we've pulled in. Actually, the library pretty much does this for you. What it will do is it starts with the SEL4 device tree, prunes it all down to just the minimal set of entries that are needed for the devices you wish this particular instance of the library to, to work with. And then it does things like replace the bus addresses that are stored in the device tree with the virtual memory addresses that we've just mapped. So that way, the device driver code doesn't need to change. All it ever sees are the virtual memory addresses, which are mapped onto your memory map type of your hardware. And then we need to perform a bit of extra initialization. Obviously we need to initialize all of the UBoot subsystems that we've pulled out. And there's a couple of pieces of infrastructure here, which are very UBoot specific. And this is all about keeping the UBoot code happy and making it believe it's still running within the whole of U-Boot in a way that's nicely set up. Uh, so U-Boot has a concept called global data, which is a large globally visible structure, which contains lots of settings, error flags, and all of that sort of thing. We need to fake a version of that to put U-Boot in, put the U-Boot code into a mode uh, where it doesn't place any real restrictions on what we want to do. So we pretend we're at the end of the second stage bootloader and we have finished relocating to RAM and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, another thing we need to we need to fake for the U-Boot code are, are things that U-Boot calls linker lists. Um, so within all of the optional elements that uh, can go into a U-Boot binary, what it ends up doing is it has some dedicated linker sections where it lists all of the elements that happen to be in this particular build. So those might be drivers or command line options. Obviously, that's not going to work for our library. So as initialization, uh, we have a platform-specific piece of code that builds these equivalent arrays. And we provide modified versions of the macros that the U-Boot code would normally use to access the data. So it loads it from, from what we've set up rather than trying to access uh, some section from Linker. Uh, and the final main technical challenge and one of the more insurmountable ones is 
the UBIT code is obviously written and intended to be used uh, and executed within a virtual address space. It's never intended to be executed within a virtual address space. Normally, that doesn't make much of a difference, but it does cause problems when we're trying to use device drivers that need DMA. Uh, the code by default in the device drivers just assumes that it can allocate a piece of memory, pass the address of that memory to the hardware for purposes of DMA communication. Obviously, if it's going to do that when it's running in uh, a SEL4 application, it's going to pass the address of a virtual, a virtual memory address to the, to the device. Uh, obviously, hardware devices can't do DMA transfers to virtual memory addresses, so there's a slight problem there, obviously. <laughs> Uh, so this is one case where actually some limited modification of the driver are required. Uh, it's not as bad as it sounds. Obviously, only drivers using DMA are, in, are in, impacted. And even then, not all drivers that use DMA are impacted here. Any drivers in U-Boot that have been ported from Linux, which is quite a few of them, tend to use uh, an API from Linux called the DMA Mapping API. We've as part of our library, provided an SEL4 specific implementation of that API that allows any drivers that use that API to work unmodified. For any drivers that do require some modifications, we provide some nice utility routines to support this. So it tends to be line for line, one to one replacements of a few. Uh, so, for example, we might, we might need to replace a few alloc and freeze with a, a DMA equivalent call. Uh, but that is the limit of the modifications we found necessary to any of the device drivers. Okay, so that's what we built. Quick example of it actually in use. Um, if you use U-Boot, you will know that it is a tool you interact with through the command line. So it probably shouldn't be too much of a surprise that the primary interface uh, to our library is textual commands. So there's a single API call called run command, uh, where you provide the exact same text string of the command you would have typed into U-Boot. And all of the U-Boot code that we've, we've held will do the exact same thing for you. Uh, so this is actually a really powerful mechanism. So you can run through this one, one command. You can run commands to control the GPIO line to switch an LED on or off to read some data from a sensor on the I squared C bus, uh, to read some data from a file on the SD card into a particular memory location. You can do all of these things through that one interface. So yeah, it's just a very easy way for us to expose a lot of the capabilities of UBID. Uh, you see here, this is actually some output from our library where we've run three commands. First one is just USB start. So it starts up the USB host controller and scans the bus. Then we've got USB tree just to display uh, the tree structure of what it's found on the USB bus. In this case, it's found a Logitech USB keyboard and then USB stop, as you'd expect, it stops the host controller. Text commands like this, um, for some uses may end up being a little bit clunky. Appreciate that. Uh, the, the library would be very easily extendable to replace any of those with programmatic equivalents if, if people found that necessary. Uh, and there's a couple of other things we've done to the library to extend it to do things that the underlying U-Boot code was never intended to do. Uh, so for example, we've provided a couple of public interfaces to send and receive raw Ethernet frames. This is how we've allowed the the library to be hooked up to an external TCP stack. And we've also added a very simple interface just to read inputs from character devices. So this allows you to receive key presses from USB keyboard, for example. Okay, uh, that's generally how you interact with the library. How, how do you build it into, a, into an overall application? You could have a single instance of the library which uses every single device on your platform. That's great, it'll work. Um, but if you're using SEL4, you're probably a little bit more interested in isolation than that. Uh, so what you can do as part of initializing the library, you provide each instance the list of the devices which you wish to access. You name the devices from the device tree. Uh, so as long as you, so you can have multiple instances running at the same time, in different components, uh, as long as obviously you provide each one with a disjoint set of devices. Obviously, don't try and use two of them to touch the same device or 
you'll have some fun. Uh, so this is this is actually a, 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 one of the demo applications from our developer kit it has this exact structure. So we've got three different components, each with uh, a different instance of the library. One of them is receiving input from a USB keyboard. One of them happens to be writing log files uh, onto an SD card, and one of them is accessing uh, accessing the network. Uh, obviously, you need to do the usual SAL4 capabilities. So obviously, for each of those instances, you need to provide the capabilities for those components to be able to access the desired hardware. OK, and we said we want this library to be extendable. So how do you actually end up, how do you go about doing that? Uh, what do you need to do if you want to add a new platform, a new driver? So obviously, the first thing you probably need to do is go and update our build script, the CMake script. Um, so the examples I've got here on the right are exactly the changes we made to add the Android C2 platform. Um, what you'll generally see is the changes you need to make to extend the library are pretty mechanical and pretty formulaic. Uh, that is the entire change to, to the CMake script to add, add the Android C2. Um, in fact, we only needed to pull in one, this one driver, which does both pin multiplexing and GPIO on, the, on that particular device. Um, the linker lists I talked about where we need to provide uh, the arrays in memory of the same data that U-Boot would have expected to find in the linker sections. Uh, for each platform, you just provide a, a, an initialization routine like this where you list out the, the set of drivers or driver classes or commands that you wish for. Uh, so actually, in terms of updating the, the, our library to handle the Odroid C2, uh, up to being able to turn on or off the LEDs on the board, which are connected through GPIO, what you're seeing there is actually pretty much the sum total of all of the modifications necessary to the library. And all of that work took me I think, a couple of hours to extend the library to provide support for a whole new board uh, and a number of drivers. Uh, there are some cases where some of the more complex drivers have some timing requirements. They need access to a monotonic real-time clock. If you're using any such devices for a new platform, you'll need to provide some mechanism for the library to have access to such, such a clock. And obviously, as I said, if your drivers use DMA, there might be necessary for some minor modifications. So, okay, so I think the general takeaway from this is there are some potential downsides with this approach, uh, performance and uh, verifiability. Uh, on the plus side, it's very, very easy for you to add pretty extensive driver support for any platform out there, or certainly any platform that's supported by U-Boot, and that's pretty much all of them. Uh, so yeah, you could add pretty much full support for a board in hours or days of work rather than weeks or longer if you're, you're having to do bespoke porting of drivers. Okay. okay. Thank you, Stephen. Questions? Yes. All right, I'll start at the front. Yeah, thanks. So it's pretty interesting and it's pretty cool to see that that you can port drivers that quickly, although my heart skipped a beat when you said textual command interface, but uh, maybe that's just me. So, um, as, and my understanding of U-Boot is that it's a, a, it has an immense number of supported devices and, and drivers and stuff, but as far as I understand it, they're not intended to be run for a long time, at least as far as I understand what you would do, which is boot whatever next thing you want to boot. So have you run into any stability issues with these drivers when you use them in a, like, run your systems for longer periods of time? We haven't run into any issues like that, no. Um, I guess that is always possible as you say the use cases for those drivers may be slightly different to, to what most most people would uh, be using a driver for but to this point no we haven't haven't seen any issues of like that uh, Daniel from ETH thank you for the talk um I had a question so lot lots of modern SOCs you need to talk to some sort of a power management unit or something if you want to turn something on at runtime, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
you would have drivers for these. <laughs> do they work with your library or do you sort of need to statically configure that in the bootloader and then just make use of it? Uh, you're quite right there. <laughs> um, this is one uh, another potential limitation. In our developer kit, this, this is one of the areas that's covered in a lot more detail, actually. Uh, to access the power management through a lot of the SOCs, you need to do things such as uh, um, uh, you need to make calls into the firmware, which is not supported or possible under SEL4. The way around that, obviously, is if you intend to use a particular device, make sure you turn the power on to it through your bootloader before you drop into SEL4. So there's, there's a workaround. You can't dynamically turn power on or off uh, in, in that way, but uh, it's a pretty minor limitation, really. Thanks. We've got an online question. Yeah, this was uh, from Rowan Subramanian. Uh, is the library extensible or scalable to boards that span across different architectures? And did you try your POC on non-ARM boards? We haven't extended it uh, to anything outside of ARM. Uh, there is no reason it couldn't be extended to outside of ARM. The the CMake build script we we put in. Uh, has the capabilities and has the structure built into it to allow it to be extended to other architectures, mm -hmm. uh, but we haven't done any of the work to do that yet. No, so it's certainly possible, but not at the moment. Thanks. Any other questions? All right, I have a question. Um, so oh, there is. Oh, Hello. Um, so, if I understand it correctly, you basically have a shim that makes um, the 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 rest of the SEL4 system look to the U-boot driver like U-boot. Um, my question is, would it be possible to put in another one to make the U-boot driver um, look like an instance of the device driver framework that we just had a talk of today? I mean, it wouldn't be performant. It wouldn't be um, verified or okay. anything, but um, if you could get that, then we would have at least the same interface. You could get a board up quickly for okay. development and so on, and then switch to better drivers later. Uh, yeah, I've not considered that. Um, I don't see any reason why that wouldn't be possible. No, I mean, it's you could provide some shim, as you said, on, onto the onto the standard U boot commands that would perform the equivalent. Uh, equivalent functionality, yes. Uh, I don't see any obvious showstoppers to, to say, no, you can do that. Now I am going to ask my question. Um, <laughs> it's actually a very simple question. In okay. your example showing the Odroid C2, mm. you had like three drivers. Is that all that it supported or was that just additional C2 specific ones? That is uh, that's just the, I'd say we, we weren't looking to provide extensive support to that board. It was just as a proof of concept to demonstrate how a second board could be added. Uh, so to perform that, we didn't. We, we only added the minimal drivers necessary to, to, to be able to control the onboard LED in this case. Right. So if it was more extensive, it'd be a longer list. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it would. Yes, indeed. Uh, and yeah, the developer kit provides the extension uh, onto the Otroid C2 platform as a very detailed worked example. So if people were looking to extend to their own platform, they could follow through that and use that as a worked example. All right. One more. Is this open source or is this a product that we need to buy? This is all going to be open source. It's not been released yet. It's in some final checks, but yes, it will be open source. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay.